reclaim their seats or a seat. We will start with the second presentation today. And so I would like to welcome up NORAM Retreat uh, and their presentation with questions to follow. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Carl Finlay. I am a process engineer in the wastewater group with NORAM. I'm joined here this afternoon by my colleague, John Baird, who's a senior project manager. John's going to answer all of the difficult questions at the end of the presentation for us. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, Vertreat, which is the other technology offering that we have uh, from NORAM, uh, other than what uh, EcoFluid uh, presented uh, with Brian's presentation. Um, so uh, I'll go through the, the slides and then there should be some time at the end for uh, all of your questions. Oh, and thanks very much to Westside Solutions for the invitation to come and present uh, on, the, on the Vertrate technology. So uh, what I'd like to do is go through uh, a bit of an overview of NORAM, uh, who we are, uh, then I'll get into uh, an overview of the Vertreat process, uh, then uh, get into case studies of plants that have been built uh, using the Vertreat process. Uh, NORAM is a, uh, well, NORAM Engineering and Constructors is our full name. Uh, we just generally call ourselves NORAM. Uh, we are a privately owned uh, company uh, founded in 1988, uh, located, uh, our, our head office is in uh, Vancouver. Uh, we have six major business areas, uh, wastewater treatment being one of them, uh, nitration, which is the production of mononitrobenzene uh, for uh, petrochemicals, uh, is another area that we have uh, patented technology. Likewise, uh, sulfuric acid, uh, electrochemical uh, processes, pulp and paper, and environmental processes. Uh, we have executed projects on five continents, uh, so we uh, very much are involved in projects around the world and across all of those business lines. Uh, we have uh, wholly owned uh, subsidiaries. Um, uh, BC Research uh, is our uh, research and development laboratory, which is located in Burnaby. Um, and that does uh, contract R&D for uh, chemical engineering processes, um, as well as R&D for NORAM on our own processes. <coughs> We also have a fabrication workshop called Axton in uh, Anasus Island. And we also have an international office uh, of, of NORAM in Sweden. So uh, the main subject of the, the talk that I want to give is our Vertreat process. Uh, Vertreat is a patented process uh, uh, from NORAM. Um, and it's a high rate suspended growth uh, activated sludge process uh, using a vertical in-ground aerobic reactor. Uh, and it's been proven in applications ranging in size from 200 cubic meters a day uh, all the way up to 50,000 cubic meters a day or 50 MLD megaliters per day. So how does it work? Um, Basically, uh, wastewater comes in and uh, meets with, um, let me see here. I'll just point out some of the major features using the mouse here. So the influent comes in and meets with the return sludge coming back from the clarifier. Uh, in, in that respect, it's, it's similar to uh, many biological um, treatment processes. Uh, then uh, w the true difference really starts at that point where the uh, influent and the uh, return activated sludge uh, gravitate down into the um, aerobic uh, deep shaft uh, reactor system 
which is in ground. Uh, the system is uh, around 93 metres deep in the ground. Uh, air is injected at the bottom of the reactor into what we call the saturation zone or the soak zone. Um, at the pressure which the water is under at that depth, uh, there's a much higher oxygen transfer efficiency and a much greater solubility of oxygen. And that leads to a number of um, benefits for the process, uh, which, which I'll get into a little bit later on. Uh, the air also induces uh, circulation of the reactor and the, the air further induces the hydraulic flow of the fluid through the um, uh, reactor circuit to the clarifier and, um, and back again, basically. So, the, as the oxygen moves into solution, um, carbonaceous constituents are oxidized by the biomass. Uh, potentially ammonia constituents are oxidized also uh, and the oxygen transfer efficiency is um, higher than regular activated sludge systems because of the depth of the reactor uh, with oxygen transfer efficiency up to 65% uh, compared with say around 15% for conventional systems. So this is really one of the major differentiating points of this technology. Uh, the aeration provides vigorous mixing. The, the number of shafts and the diameter of the shafts is determined by the organic loading, so the BOD or biochemical oxygen demand. Um, and so the, the size of the, the shaft is the, um, or number of shafts and size of is determined by the uh, BOD loading. Um, the other uh, feature is that when the mixed liquor leaves the reactor, it's leaving in a supersaturated condition from uh, depth in the reactor. So uh, it comes up from a 92 meter level uh, with uh, biomass um, and is, is saturated, supersaturated with air as the pressure is um, re reducing as it comes back to uh, atmospheric pressure at the surface. Um, and that triggers um, air bubbles to come out of solution and those air bubbles aid in the flotation of the biomass in the clarifier. So the clarifier in this case, um, unlike uh, traditional activated sludge, uh, our clarifier in Vertreat is a flotation clarifier where the biomass floats to the surface of the clarifier and that enables um, uh, the biomass to be thickened uh, straight off the clarifier to uh, up to around 4% solids, uh, which is significantly more than can be achieved in uh, regular conventional activated sludge. Um, and it also um, aids with uh, the um, separation uh, and al allows the units to produce effluent quality uh, down to around uh, 10 BOD, 10 TSS. <coughs> the uh, Vertreat system can be configured in a number of uh, different um, uh, ways. Uh, one of the ways is to, um, or, or the, the, the previous slides showed the, the sort of the core process, which is for BOD removal. Uh, the process can also be configured for ammonia removal uh, beyond BOD and then it can be further configured for uh, nitrogen removal by denitrification by the addition of an anoxic tank at the front of the process. So in that particular case, influent comes in and is mixed uh, with um, a mixed liquor return um, and that uh, tank is, is anoxic, so it runs with a low uh, dissolved oxygen uh, content which is required for the denitrification process. Okay, so I'm just going to play a quick video now, which is from one of our uh, plants. 
and this is a, a video showing a sample being taken of the um, uh, mixed liquor leaving the reactor and, and entering the clarifier. Uh, so this sample shows the, the natural flotation tendencies that that mixed liquor has as it enters the clarifier. Uh, this, is about, this is about two or three minutes long. So the brown stuff you can see in the top of the sample is the biomass, which is the, uh, I guess, the sort of the catalyst of the process that's responsible for doing the um, removal of um, organic constituents from the water. And the function of the clarifier is to remove those, um, those bugs and uh, bring them back into the process. So effectively, what you can see here in the video is uh, a, a representation in, in, in the flask of what's happening inside the clarifier. Uh, so after the fluid enters the clarifier, the um, biomass naturally separates off to the top of the clarifier and is skimmed off and brought back into the system. So now the operator shakes the sample a couple of times just to demonstrate that even after shaking the sample, or let's say disturbing the float on the clarifier, uh, it still refloats again. So that's the biomass, that's, that's all the bugs that do the work in the unit and that is sort of representative of effluent quality as it would, uh, as it would be uh, heading towards the end of the clarifier there. Okay, so that's a pretty neat video. Um, so the process advantages. Um, the the major advantages of Vertreat is that uh, it is a very low footprint process. So it takes up a very small amount of land in comparison to conventional activated sludge plants. Um, and it can be down as far as 20% of the footprint of a conventional plant. So that can be very uh, beneficial where uh, there's just very little land available for the siting of uh, a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the reasons for this is that the process is a um, high rate process. Uh, so it has um, uh, faster kinetics in terms of the um, biological and uh, oxygen transfer. Uh, it uses uh, in-ground reactor volume rather than above-ground reactor volume. And it uses flotation clarifiers which can um, uh, uh, handle a higher mixed liquor suspended solids uh, than uh, conventional clarifiers and also um, it does away with any thickening uh, step of the, on the, um, the float uh, prior to dewatering. 
because of the in-ground uh, deep shaft reactor system and the high oxygen transfer efficiency at depth, uh, the oxygen transfer efficiency is um, uh, significantly greater than uh, conventional activated sludge. And since aeration energy use is one of the, if not the uh, largest uh, energy consumption at uh, conventional uh, aerobic uh, treatment plants, uh, this all leads to a low energy consumption for the Vertrate technology. Uh, and it, it can be as low as 50% of a conventional plant. Uh, because of the uh, in-ground deep shaft reactor system and the high oxygen transfer efficiency at depth, uh, there's a highly aerobic environment which acts to oxidize aerobic, um, sorry, odorous uh, compounds. Um, and also the, um, the, the, the uh, aerobic uh, head tank deep shaft system is um, contained um, uh, within a, a head tank structure and a very compact footprint. Um, so I guess there's two benefits from that. Firstly, the odour from the system is uh, very low because of the aerobic uh, nature of the system. Uh, so that lends itself to positioning uh, vertrate plants potentially in uh, or close to residential areas, uh, as I'll get to later. Um, and it also means that uh, uh, should additional treatment be uh, um, sought in the process uh, for the off-gasses, um, then that's easy to do because of the uh, contained nature of those uh, off-gasses as well. Uh, the system gives excellent BOD and TSS reduction, and uh, low ammonia and low uh, total nitrogen are achievable with a, a biological uh, nitrogen removal flow sheet. So, uh, as I said, um, this process is ideal for uh, alleviating site constraints such as um, footprint limitations or where there's just very little land available for uh, installation of a treatment plant, uh, where that land might be in close proximity to residents um, who might be concerned about odour and, and, and visual impacts. Um, this has been particularly relevant uh, in, in some past projects in extreme uh, temperature uh, areas uh, which require uh, enclosure of the process in a building. Um, and uh, in high seismic zones, uh, there's benefits to having a compact uh, process and uh, minimising the size of above ground uh, tankage that might need to be designed for post disaster conditions. So just to put uh, a little bit more uh, illustration behind the uh, footprint, um, this is a comparison of the Northwest Langley treatment plant uh, footprint uh, on the left here, uh, which treats um, uh, 12,000 uh, cubic metres a day uh, to 45 BOD, 45 TSS. Uh, and this is compared against uh, a, a recent NORAM uh, vertrate plant uh, in China, uh, the Xingping uh, plant, which treats 50,000 cubic metres a day uh, within the same footprint uh, to uh, a more stringent effluent uh, requirement of 25 BOD, 25 t uh, 30 TSS. So the same footprint. In fact, actually not shown here is the um, uh, equalisation um, lagoon uh, there at uh, Northwest Langley. So in fact, uh, Northwest Langley has an even larger footprint to some degree than what's shown there. So that's just to illustrate, you know, four times the throughput, the same uh, uh, footprint. Um, and here's some uh, data from a previous plant, uh, recorded data showing the oxygen transfer efficiency. Uh, in this particular vertrate plant, uh, oxygen transfer was measured up to 
a maximum of 86%, an average of 75%. Uh, that compares to a conventional system at maybe uh, 15%. So big difference there. Okay, so for the West Side um, RFTI, uh, we uh, submitted information um, for footprint and cost and uh, manning levels and uh, energy. Uh, I'm just going to uh, touch on a few of those. Uh, the the basis of our submission um, was the um, uh, I guess the, the the mandated treatment level. Um, of uh, uh, 25 uh, BOD, 25 TSS, uh, total residual chlorine 0.02, uh, unionized ammonia 1.25, fish toxicity and pH uh, requirements. So that's a combination of the federal WSER regs and the provincial um, MWR regs. Maybe I'll just go back now. And, and um, so we, we focused on the mandated treatment level. Um, uh, like many um, processes, in order to reach a higher effluent quality, um, it's uh, certainly possible to install um, additional filtration and disinfection at the back end of a vertrate plant, uh, much the same way as uh, Brian was discussing uh, the approach for the alternate treatment levels uh, for the ecofluid systems. Uh, so um, that is entirely possible with Vertreat uh, uh, as well. Um, but uh, the, so we looked at uh, the, the mandated treatment levels and the uh, footprints that would be necessary um, and submitted this data that could uh, potentially be used as an indication of whether this technology would be a suitable fit for uh, available uh, plots of land within Westside. So um, we have uh, vertrate plants that span the full range from uh, five megalitres a day all the way up to uh, 50 megalitres a day. Uh, so the, the, the process is proven and capable of uh, spanning that range. Um, so the, uh, the footprint uh, of the core vertrate, like if we just take uh, five uh, megalitres a day as an example, uh, the vertrate um, system, including the, the shafts and head tanks and clarifiers, uh, would be 330 uh, square metres. Uh, the total process then, by the time you add on uh, the headwork screening and degridding, uh, tertiary filtration, disinfection, sludge dewatering and uh, chemical storage uh, would be around, uh, in that particular case, around sort of three times the core vertrate process. Uh, so around uh, a thousand square metres. And then if you add on uh, parking and uh, roadway access for vehicles and stuff like that, then uh, that would bring the total site for a five megalitre per day plant up to around 1,800 uh, square metres uh, as an indication. Uh, so this is uh, a graph that we submitted uh, along with the RFTI uh, information, uh, which just sort of shows the, the build up of, of those uh, footprints. Um, now, uh, we, we scaled back from a number of uh, existing vertrate plants uh, to show historical footprints, um, which are, is this line here. Uh, but uh, we felt that it was important to point out that a number of those plants um, used an available plot of land, uh, not necessarily in the most compact fashion uh, that they could have. Uh, so uh, we feel that that reduction would be possible from uh, where that line is. Uh, down to um, the, the line shown um, uh, here, essentially. So useful information regarding uh, the vertrate capabilities for footprint. Uh, indicative total project cost, uh, we provided a range. Um, again, we, 
we took the approach here of uh, taking the uh, total installed cost for past projects um, and uh, showing how this um, uh, stacks up against the uh, size of the plant in order to to give an indication of uh, what the sort of projected cost, um, you know, as a per uh, dollar per megalitre per day of capacity. So, you know, in round terms, um, the, the low end of the cost range for historical Vertrade projects uh, is around um, $2 um, per, uh, uh, sorry, $2 or, yeah, so it's be two, uh, let me make sure I get this right, um, $2 million per uh, megalitre per day, um, uh, up to uh, $5 uh, million per megalitre per day. Um, so, I guess to, to put that against projects that have been done in the past, uh, Dawson um, City Wastewater Treatment Plant was a uh, five megalitre per day uh, capacity uh, plant um, in terms of, uh, or at least in terms of the um, MWR regs it would be. Um, and that was done for $25 million. However, that represents the high end of the cost range in our view because that was a northern climate uh, project construction. Um, and there's some unique challenges involved in um, constructing plants in an in a environment like that that uh, mean that that's more expensive than in many other environments. Uh, then at the other end of the range, um, uh, we have a plant in China that, uh, after converting to, you know, a Canadian um, construction location and $2015, would come out to be $1 million per megalitre per day. So basically a 50 MLD plant around $50 million. Okay, so no, now I'm going to move on to some project uh, profiles. Um, the first one, uh, Zingping in China, this was a Vertrate plant that was commissioned in uh, 2009. Uh, it has uh, two shaft head tanks. Uh, it treats uh, 50,000 cubic metres per day, uh, which, uh, which is municipal uh, influent with uh, some industrial uh, in the municipal uh, influent. Uh, equivalent to about 130,000 uh, people population equivalent. Uh, it treats two effluent standards of 25 BOD, 30 TSS, and uh, average effluent achieved has been down around 12, 12. And that plant is selling reuse quality water to local industrial uh, users. Uh, that's a rendering of the plant uh, prior to construction. Uh, some photos from construction. Uh, what, what you can see here is the, uh, the uh, drill uh, auger um, uh, prior to drilling of the, uh, the shaft. Uh, these uh, sections of, um, th these are sections of uh, the steel in-ground reactor which uh, is a welded reactor that goes in um, and is encased in, in concrete. Uh, this is photos uh, from the commissioning stage of the plant. And uh, a year later. So this, uh, this photo at the bottom left here is showing um, the clarifiers. and some vegetables being grown used, using the treated effluent. A bit of a uh, overall view from, from side on of the plant there. 
uh, Qingdao in China. So this was another Vertrade plant by Noram that was uh, commissioned in uh, 2012. Uh, this was a BNR plant, so it was achieving uh, low total nitrogen, low total phosphorus. Uh, it has uh, uh, three shaft head tanks. Uh, it treats 40,000 cubic metres a day um, and uh, population equivalent uh, around 180,000 people. So the effluent standards that that plant uh, is achieving is 10 BOD, 10 TSS, uh, 15 total nitrogen, 5 ammonia, and 0.5 milligrams a litre total phosphorus. Okay, uh, there was uh, a question in the RFTI for Westside, and there's been a question already today about uh, uh, installing plants as part of multi-use buildings. Uh, Vertrate is a technology which lends itself uh, to exactly that. And in fact, um, there are uh, three uh, deep shaft uh, wastewater treatment plants um, that were in fact installed in buildings in the uh, basement of buildings in Japan um, during the 80s and 90s. Uh, and so uh, these are uh, shown in the, the photos here. So that's the Tokyo Dome uh, sports facility uh, and um, a couple of uh, multi-use uh, office and uh, uh, I'm not too sure if there's residential, but uh, certainly office buildings there. Uh, Homer, Alaska is another uh, uh, plant, a deep shaft plant commissioned in 1991, uh, which was awarded um, the 1993 uh, AWWA Large Plant of the Year Award uh, for Alaska, and uh, the EPA wrote up the, the US EPA wrote up a, uh, a performance certification uh, report uh, on that plant, uh, and that. Uh, treats uh, 3,300 cubic metres a day uh, down to um, an average of around uh, 10 BOD and 15 TSS. Uh, the nearest uh, Vertreat uh, deep shaft plant is actually at the Chevron uh, refinery in Burnaby. So this is the uh, oil refinery in Vancouver. Uh, that Wastewater treatment plant treats the uh, process water and runoff water from the process areas of the oil refinery. Um, and it was originally commissioned in 1996. And uh, that uh, won the 1997 British Columbia uh, Water and Wastewater Association Industrial Pollution Control Award. So that's a very easy plant uh, to go and um, uh, visit uh, with, uh, with Chevron's permission and with, with our involvement. Uh, we still have a very close relationship with Chevron there um, with uh, an operations advisory contract uh, with uh, Chevron. Now that's a photo of site on of the, uh, the plant at Chevron. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that uh, Chevron um, elected to, to use this technology because uh, they had a very limited plot space available for the wastewater treatment plant and uh, there were very few technologies that could actually fit within that uh, available space. Dawson City in Canada uh, is uh, the, the next uh, case study here. This plant was commissioned in uh, 2012. Uh, it has uh, two shafts. Uh, in fact, this plant was designed as two 100% capacity process trains uh, to treat uh, 2,500 cubic metres a day average and 4,000 cubic metres a day uh, peak. Uh, for a population which ranges from 1,400 in uh, 
the winter time all the way up to about 5,000 in the summertime. Uh, and the effluent standards uh, to be achieved, uh, 25 BOD, 25 TSS and 100% uh, uh, LC50, which is uh, fish toxicity. Uh, this plant is uh, completely enclosed in a building due to the harsh winter conditions um, uh, in the location. Uh, it actually has an integrated heat recovery uh, system to uh, recover uh, heat from the effluent water from the plant uh, before discharging the wastewater to the Yukon River. That's a rendering uh, of the building uh, during the design phase. Uh, these are some photos from uh, the construction phase. So uh, what you can see on the bottom left-hand side is one of the deep shafts being uh, lifted into position. Uh, so as you can see, the, the, the shaft is welded together in sections and then lowered into uh, the uh, hole that's drilled in the ground to place the uh, reactor and then it's grouted in place uh, with... Uh, with concrete around the outside. Uh, that's a nice shot of the um, concrete structures of the plant, uh, showing the the the, um, the the two head tanks. So the aerobic reactor volume you can see is a very small footprint uh, because of the fact that it's uh, largely in ground, and then the two flotation clarifiers here. Uh, and then uh, the uh, UV disinfection uh, channel there. And that's what the building looks like today. Uh, so that is the plant in operation. Um, in fact, uh, the nearest residences are right there. Uh, so virtually uh, right next door to the plant. Um, and in fact, the... Uh, off gases from the reactor, uh, the aerobic reactor system leave from that architectural feature in the uh, roof of the building and the plant has not had any odour problems uh, related to the process itself. Um, so that's a demonstration of the, uh, the, the potential to use this technology in, in residential areas. And that's an overview of where that plant is relative to the uh, sort of surrounding houses. Uh, it's, uh, you know, virtually right in the centre of town there. There's uh, the, uh, the swimming pool, the municipal swimming pool is right across the road, uh, baseball field. Um, uh, so residences uh, all around really. Uh, so the footprint of that uh, particular plant, um, uh, although that plant is designed for 2,500 cubic metres average and uh, 4,000 peak, it's uh, two times 100% trains. In terms of the, the British Columbia um, MWR regs, that would be uh, equivalent to a, a 5,000 uh, cubic metre a day or 5 MLD plant. Uh, and it has a, a footprint for the building of 1,100 square metres. So that's a very compact plant. Um, and then the, the parking spaces and, and, and uh, access uh, sort of would be on top of that. So uh, I'll just finish up now and then we can uh, get into questions. So just a quick recap. Uh, Vertrate is a low footprint process. It's low energy consumption. It's low odour. It's a proven technology. Uh, and uh, it uh, comes from a privately owned uh, uh, British Columbia based uh, company. So thank you very much. We have references uh, available upon request uh, and now uh, just open the floor to questions if there are any. And if you want to wave your hand wildly, perfect. I can probably make myself heard, but it's just like the. It's just for the. Uh, People online. Um, so uh, these plants, big or small, do they require a 24-hour presence of human beings or are they automated? No, nope, uh, they're automated. 
Uh, so typically, um, it, depending on the size and complexity of the plant, um, uh, it depends on the operator manning uh, level. Uh, but typically out of hours, uh, these plants have a, an automated call-out system. So a process alarm um, will automatically ring through to uh, uh, an on-call operator's uh, cell phone. Uh, and they would be located in an area where they can go quickly to the plant if they need to. So essentially, um, uh, for example, a plant like Dawson is is staffed uh, 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 during the week uh, on a sort of a nine to five basis. And then um, I think occasionally on weekends as needed, but uh, after hours, certainly in the evening, there's nobody there. I, I would guess that it's uh, more expensive to build than a conventional plant, the type of plant you've compared it to several times. Um, because of the excavation, but uh, is it is it a lot cheaper to run? Does that uh, make itself up over the life of the plant? Yeah, it, it's not necessarily um, uh, more expensive to build. Um, the so so t and to put this in in context, this might help you understand why that that is. Um, the vertrate system is a high rate system, and that means that it has a short hydraulic retention time in the reactor. Uh, typically around two hours. Uh, conventional activated sludge uh, plants uh, might use a, uh, a hydraulic retention time uh, of, say, uh, 15 hours. So they require much bigger reactor uh, volumes to achieve uh, the same uh, uh, treatment. Um, so uh, to some extent, the, the cost of installing the shaft in the ground is offset by the fact that it's a smaller reactor than a conventional system. Uh, then uh, the, the other offsetting factor, as you said, is that the, the lower operating costs associated with uh, lower aeration um, requirements for the process. I hope that answers your question. So you're 92 meters down. Um, that seems a pretty deep hole. We're in a very rocky to clay surface around here with um, many, many um, kind of secondary fault lines just riddling the area. Um, what I'm, I'm assuming you would have to take some seismic samplings to see what that ground really is you're going into. Um, and what do you do in terms of mitigating seismic activity, the effects of seismic activity on your um, build? I'm going to throw it to John to answer that one. Typically, we would, uh, you do a borehole before you put the main shaft down. So you'd find out what, what is it right down there. Um, nor the, unless you're right on a, you know, a fault that's going to slip in an earthquake, you're very well protected because the shaft is in ground, moves very nicely with everything else. You're well grouted in place. Um, I don't think we've ever come across a, a drilled situation where we've been in a fault line that would damage the shaft, um, you know, from a, you know, in any of the plants that we've ever looked at and, and drilled. Drilling is uh, site specific, so you would have to look at what kind of uh, you know, subsurface geology there is there. But we've, uh, you know, through the years, they've gone through everything from soft soils to uh, hard rock. One of the China sites, they actually mined. They uh, drilled and blasted and then put a slip uh, concrete casing down before they put the, uh, the steel casing down and grouted it in place. So there's the, again, uh, really depends specifically on what soil conditions that you do have. Um, just, um, so you pour cement, you have a steel casing, you pour cement around that. What's the life of the steel casing given the acidity of the um, 
junk we're putting in? Uh, it's long. I mean, it's. Uh, I, I think it's of the order of uh, 50 years plus uh, based on the... We use very thick walled carbon steel and we know the corrosion rate based on historical uh, units and the conditions within the, the, the unit. So um, it's, I mean, typically it's going to be sort of 30 to 40 years plus, which is a typical design life for a wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> Just one more. You're, it seems to me you're down far enough to maybe recover geothermal heat. Any comments on that? You're probably not quite deep enough to get much real effective heat back out of it. The process itself, the biological process, does produce some heat. So we do, uh, um, with depending on the grouts that you use and the actual ground conditions, it can insulate and help that as well. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the first presentation by Ecofluid, I believe they mentioned that they were purchased by NORAM? That's right, yep. So uh, Ecofluid oh. is um, sort of majority owned by NORAM, and, and, and that uh, it, it's in transition uh, essentially, uh, I think within uh, a year or two, uh, Ecofluid will be wholly owned by NORAM. So you've got sort of competing technologies within the same house? Yeah, I, I would say horses for courses. Uh, <laughs> they're, uh, they're different technologies that do uh, slightly different, that have slightly different uh, attributes, I would say. Uh, my other question is uh, this uh, potential project has been around Victoria for quite a number of years. Uh, have either of your firms been involved with any of the initial stages? Uh, yes, NORAM has uh, uh, presented Vertreat as an option for CRD uh, previously, I would say possibly 10 years ago, um, certainly in that time frame. Um, uh, I don't, uh, I, I it was before my time with NORAM, and I don't know too much more than that, to be honest. Okay. Thank you. I'm curious about maintenance when it comes to shafts. Uh, would you need more than one shaft so you could close one down while you maintain the other, or can you make do depending on the... Bio load. How does that work? Um, the uh, the approach that is um, uh, I, I guess stipulated within the MWR regs in uh, British Columbia is to use two uh, process trains uh, of uh, seventy five percent capacity peak capacity. So that, it, that would be the approach that we would use for a, a treatment uh, plant here. Um, uh, so that offers the potential to uh, take one process train out of service for maintenance. However, it, it's worth pointing out that uh, the uh, Chevron refinery uh, plant is built as a single train uh, unit, but with dual clarifiers. So different parts of the process require different levels of uh, redundancy and maintenance. The shaft and head tank are um, a virtually maintenance-free type uh, system because there's no moving parts within them. Um, and if there are uh, maintenance activities to be done, they can typically be done very quickly, um, uh, sort of on the run, uh, and, and are in fact tackled that way at that plant. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, that's something that is um, looked at in detail during the design stage of a project and the level of redundancy at each stage of the process is uh, very much thought about and designed in as appropriate. Any further questions? Both, both projects talked about um, some sort of tank or container for the uh, influent coming in originally, or the 
the process starts. Right. Right. Um, is is that like a surface tank? Is that going to be like another shaft? Is it? Uh, typically, that would be uh, for our plant. That would uh, we the vertrate um, doesn't require a lot of equalization volume uh, because it's a high rate system. Uh, so typically, our plants uh, would have uh, an influent sump that takes the flow from the sewer system uh, and buffers the swings to a small extent, uh, but then essentially pumps that up. Uh, into the plant from uh, to a hydraulic uh, level at which it can uh, gravitate through the plant um, but uh, I think that would be one of the other benefits of Vertrate that there's not a significant EQ volume required in most instances thanks seems to be it final question So I'm assuming that to go to tertiary and um, um, more usable potable water, that would be a third party add-on to your system? Uh, yes, uh, essentially um, we would look at tertiary filtration and most likely membrane filtration and uh, UV disinfection. So that would be you know, that could be xenon ultrafiltration, uh, Trojan UV, as an example of the, uh, the sort of uh, the vendors of equipment like that. That's right. And, and that's something that you would coordinate with? Yes. Yeah, Does so the we, region have to go out and no, we deal would, with that? No, we would typically uh, integrate those uh, pieces of equipment within the design of the plant. Uh, much the same as, uh, say, headworks screening equipment. We already integrate that, uh, degridding, uh, you know, we, the centrifuge for dewatering the uh, sludge, um, just, just the same way that we integrate those into the design and um, uh, would, uh, depending on how the project's delivered, um, purchase and, and supply that equipment as part of the project. Just one more, the, the UV process, the efficiency of that, is that not dependent on the turbidity of the um, water? Yes, it is. It depends on mainly on a property called UV transmissivity. Um, so it's a function of the color uh, within the water and also the total suspended solids level. Yeah. that everybody? I'm, I'm trying to remember that graph of cost. Um, do you want me to go, do you want me to go back? Yeah. yeah. I can't remember what the uh, low end, or the left-hand side low price was. So at, uh, at five megaliters a day, it was about twice the price per, its, for, per volume as the, um, the other end of the graph, 50 yeah. megaliters per day. And that, that is mainly due to the economy of scale benefit that you get with larger treatment plants. Now, does that, I presume, includes all on-sites but no off-sites? Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Because that, that wasn't a building and everything? Yeah, that, that's the whole thing. That's the building. In fact, there's a lot of uh, costs that are just not related to our process within that project. So that there's uh, HVAC, uh, there's the heat recovery system, there's uh, the building itself, there's the uh, um, septage receiving facility. Uh, it, that's, the, that's the whole thing. Cost of northern construction. Cost of northern construction, yeah, yeah which we think is something like twice uh, what it is to build down here.
Thank you very much. Seeing Thank no you. more questions. Um, so I'm, I am going to ask uh, Mayor Barb Desjardins to come up and, and close it. Uh, just before we do, uh, just from me personally, thank you very much for the two excellent presentations and starting off Innovation Days. Um, like to uh, all the people who did actually come physically to the site and encourage those who, uh, and there's quite a lot watching online, we've been, we've been checking in to invite them down here tomorrow. Um, for a couple of good reasons for, for people who are presenting here, you have some opportunity in the break maybe to ask a couple more questions. And secondly, we have snacks. Um, but encourage you to come down, but if you can't, uh, be sure to, to tune back in online. As well, I just uh, I want to say that uh, next week our, we start our roundtable conversations. And for those of you here or for those of you listening at home, uh, there are still opportunities available to participate in that next round uh, moving forward to help hone down the criteria we're going to use to move forward uh, that we're going to give to decision makers. So westsidesolutions.ca, uh, you can go online there and, and look at what's available and and certainly in the info line for any questions that you have further in that, we will be checking that and get back to you or any information you want about the roundtables. So with that being said, I would like to welcome Amer Desjardins to the stage to close this afternoon's proceedings. Thanks very much. And I apologize for being late because it sounds like it's been a very informative day already. Uh, looking forward to the next two days. What a difference in process in my mind. Here we have the opportunity to understand and to learn more about what kinds of technologies are out there. And so uh, I encourage all of you that attended today to please grab a friend and come again tomorrow or at least tell them that it is online because at the end of the day, we're going through this process partly because the last one did a very poor job of bringing the public on side. And we are trying to get it so that you have understanding of dealing with the fears, dealing with the opportunities of how we can do a better job with this process and be environmentally friendly uh, and move forward with wastewater because there is no doubt we have to move forward. Uh, and uh, that ship has sailed and, and we, we're running out of time. And we're doing um, a fantastic job, in my mind, of pulling together opportunities, actions, uh, the industries to get us there. Um, but we've got a few more months left, and you have those few months to really get involved. Uh, because as we go forward from there, we're hopeful that you've already educated yourself and brought yourself into the, to, into the discussion and made your thoughts known. So the next, these innovation days are important for you to participate in. And then the next round of public engagement uh, at the different communities, they are very important as well. Um, it's, it's called per, maybe put up or shut up. Uh, because we're down to that, and we want to hear you put up and talk to us. So thank you all. Thank you to the presenters, and looking forward to next days. Really appreciate you all coming. <laughs>